Are you always wondering about the things around you? Do you always have the need to find out? Then, this is the show for you. Learn what makes things tick. Or how they simply came to be. Satisfy your curiosity. Welcome to another episode of Curious. SIM card. If you've owned a cell phone in the last few years, you probably have a SIM card. The small white piece of plastic with an electronic chip that makes your phone work. Without it, your phone won't be able to make calls. But what exactly is a SIM card? Well, a SIM card is your phone's personal identification. Your phone number is assigned by your mobile provider via your SIM. You see, radio waves from cell towers are always present around us. But without a SIM, the signals that we are supposed to send and receive have no way of knowing which phone or network to connect to. SIM cards also make sure that we are securely connected to the right networks and frequencies. You wouldn't want to receive calls and messages accidentally, do you? When someone calls you, their SIM information is sent to the wireless provider, which then connects them to you via your number. SIM cards also have a limited amount of memory that allows you to store some data like phone contacts and messages. Today's phones, however, have their built-in memory, so the contacts and messages stored in the SIM can be copied to newer phones. Because of this, most SIMs today are used solely for calling and texting and networking. But despite its memory limitation, SIM cards are still used widely. Why? It's because they're very cheap and easy to produce. Another advantage to using SIM cards is that it is removable and can therefore be used in multiple phones. Which is perfect if you find yourself wanting to change to a newer phone while maintaining your old number. Using SIM cards are also beneficial for constant travelers who might need to switch carriers while visiting different countries. Today's SIMs are decreasing in size. SIM cards used to be the size of a fingertip. Today's SIM cards are just a third of that size. What's more, newer SIMs are not just for making calls. With the development of wireless technology, SIM cards are now also used to allow our devices to connect to the internet wirelessly. UICCs or Universal Integrated Circuit Cards are basically SIMs that allow you to access 3G and 4G networks on your device. Copyright We often see copyrighted works in our everyday lives. The books we read, the shows we watch, the videos on YouTube, the articles online, and even the music that we listen to. These are all examples of copyrighted material. But why does it matter? Well, to answer that, we must first answer what a copyright is. Every time someone makes an original piece of work, like a song, a drawing, a poem, an article, or even a video, they're automatically copyright holders. Why? Because as the creator or author of your original work, you, one, own it, two, are allowed to make copies of it, three, are allowed to distribute and perform and display it, and number four, make derivative work from it. Copyright is what protects creators from other people using or taking advantage of their work. 
The following are protected under copyright law. Literary works, musical works, dramatic works, pantomimes and choreographic works, pictorial, graphic, and sculptural works, motion pictures and other audiovisual works, sound recordings, and architectural works. But why should we care? Well, most of the creators of copyrighted material actually earn a living from it. Writers, musicians, artists, filmmakers all earn money from their work, and they should. Without copyright though, these creators would have no control on how their works are distributed or if they even get compensated for it. When someone uses a creator's work without permission, copyright infringement occurs. And that's actually something that's illegal. Recent trends in the internet, however, make stopping copyright infringement more difficult, as sharing and downloading material on a global scale makes it harder to enforce. There are, of course, a few exceptions. One is fair use. Where a copyrighted material is used without permission for purposes such as criticism, comment, news reporting, teaching, scholarship, or research. What constitutes fair use, though, is debatable and is usually up to the courts to decide. Another is the expiry of copyright. Copyrights are not held forever, and the length and expiration may vary from country to country. Today's copyright laws state that the copyright lasts from the day the work was made plus 50 or 70 years after the author's death. After the copyright expires, the work shall be held in the public domain, where the general public is free to do with it as they please. Animation Do you remember watching cartoons as kids? It's really fascinating how drawings and images give life to new worlds and characters that are beyond the scope of real life. This is animation at work. At its core, animation is an illusion created when a sequence of still images are displayed rapidly, thus giving the viewer the perception of movement. And it's not just cartoons. It could be anything. Texts, graphics, and even effects. It's all animation. Let's take a quick look at how animation is done. Traditional animation. The traditional way to do animation is to hand draw or hand paint images as individual frames that constitute moving scenes. This type of animation can trace its origins to miniature spinning discs from the 1800s. These discs contained a sequence of drawings that were viewed in sequence. When the discs were spun fast enough, the illusion of movement can be seen. In the 1900s, at the dawn of film and moving pictures, artists made hand-drawn pictures that were animated by taking photographs of it, using each photo as one frame for the animation. A lot of animated material from the first half of the century has been animated using this method. Stop motion animation. This method involves manipulating real world objects at incremental movements that is captured per frame. Each subsequent movement is shot as one frame of a picture. After enough pictures are shot, these are edited to play in sequence, and this creates the illusion of movement. This method was pioneered during the late 1800s to the early 1900s and was the go-to method for making realistic or live-action style animation at the time before animatronics and computer graphics became the norm. Computer Animation This method uses computers and software to make animation. Under computer animation are two main types. First is 2D. This is pretty much the same as a traditional method. But instead of drawing to physical media such as paper, the drawings take place digitally inside computers. Coloring and other effects are also done inside the computer. The other is 3D. This utilizes 3D computer software, where three-dimensional shapes and models are sculpted in a digital environment. 
the software also makes it possible to add lighting effects, color, and textures to these models. Once the models are done, they are articulated in a 3D space. Optical media Most of the media from the last few decades have been in the form of discs. Laser discs, CDs, DVDs, and even Blu-ray discs are all forms of optical media. Data in these discs are encoded and read by lasers, hence the name optical media. Information in these discs are encoded as binary code, or ones and zeros. This is how it works. Discs usually have two layers, a reflective shiny encoding material, which is often aluminum, and a clear hard protective layer, which is usually polycarbonate. Data is encoded to the disc via a process called burning, wherein the laser etches information in the encoding layer. Think of it as very small, microscopic grooves, much like how a vinyl record has, only much smaller. When a disc is inserted into a drive, it spins and the laser tracks the data written in the disc. The data is then read and re-encoded by the computer to its intended format that can be understood by its user. Throughout the years, however, the development of better optics and lasers also meant the improvement of disc technology. The first generation discs came out in the 1980s. They were commonly known as laser discs which were then succeeded by the smaller compact discs. These utilized an infrared laser, which limited its capacity to around 700 MB for the time. Despite this, the format became the industry standard for optical media, especially for music and video distribution, replacing the analog cassette tapes and video cassettes. This format would be used well until the early 2000s. The second generation discs, also known as DVDs, utilize a narrower laser, which meant that it can also store and read more information. This format was then adopted as the standard for movie distribution for the time. DVDs allowed better picture quality and sound because of the increased storage space. The third generation, the one we currently have, utilizes blue lasers. That's why they are called Blu-ray. These lasers are narrower and thinner than the previous generation, thus providing an increased capacity. These are the preferred media format for today's movie and video game releases. Perhaps another shift in distribution and storage media is imminent. Other types of solid-state media like USBs and hard drives are slowly becoming the go-to storage media and may eventually replace the optical media just how optical media replaced tape and magnetic media a few years back. Electric guitar It's one of the most popular instruments of this century. For decades, the electric guitar has been one of the instruments that have been instrumental in creating the most popular genres of music in this century. From rock, pop, jazz, and everything in between. Let's take a look at its humble beginnings. The guitar was developed from a long line of traditional stringed instruments, which were called lutes. This action of string movement produced sound, which was acoustically amplified in the guitar's body. These were popular and enjoyed success for many years, but they lacked one thing. When played along with other instruments, like percussion and wind instruments, the acoustic guitar lacked volume, both in concert and recording environments. This is what spurred inventors and musicians to look for ways to amplify the instrument. They tried making it with bigger bodies, adding metal strings, and even making arch tops. But these were not enough. In the 1930s, the first patent for an electrically amplified guitar came. In 1931, George Buchamp and Adolf Rickenbacker produced the first electromagnetic guitar pickup. They came up with a solid body guitar, dubbed the Frying Pan, which was the first electric guitar. 
other companies like Slingerland and Fender would follow suit and design their own electrified guitars. Initially, musicians didn't like the idea and the sound it produced. But pioneering jazz and blues instrumentalists took the instrument and used it to create music, which eventually became popular. In the following decades, the electric guitar became a staple of music, played in different styles, and would follow a host of developments like a streamlined body, standardized measurement, as well as adjustable and replaceable parts. But pretty much the same technology behind the amplification works the same. One of the most popular types of electric guitar, the Stratocaster, was developed by Fender in the 1950s. Even if you don't play guitar, it's probably the image you think of when you hear the words electric guitar. Here's how an electric guitar works. Steel strings are strummed and played over the pickup. The pickup is basically an electromagnet that picks up the vibration from the strings. The string's vibrations are translated into electrical current that fluctuates according to its wave pattern. This current travels from the guitar's pickups to a guitar cable that contains conductive material. The electrical current from the guitar cable then travels to an amplifier. This takes the electric signal and transmits it to a speaker that vibrates. This vibration then produces the sound that we hear. Clock. It tells us time and how much of it has passed. Clocks are instrumental in most of the things we do from day to day. The schedules we make, travel, important dates are all made possible by using clocks. Since ancient times, man has strived to measure time and its passage. For the ancient people, knowing about time meant knowing the difference when to hunt, when to gather food, when to sleep, and other crucial daily tasks. Early civilizations used natural occurring events to measure time. The movement of the sun was one of them. This is where the sundial was based on, allowing humans to tell time based on the shadow cast by the sun. Other early clocks were the sand clock and the water clock. These clocks based timekeeping with the rate that the materials fell with gravity. In time, however, humans came up with better inventions to tell time. The pendulum clock was developed around the 16th to 17th century. Based on the principle that a pendulum swings at a constant rate, clockmakers used this to calculate precise time measurements. The next development would come in the 1670s. The hairspring is based on a coiled pre-tension spring to give clocks precise movements. This advancement was used in wind-up clocks. The smaller mechanism also contributed to the smaller form factors of clocks. And finally, fast forward to the modern era. Quartz clocks utilize a quartz crystal. Quartz oscillates at a fixed frequency, which is used as the basis for keeping time. Since the first mechanical clocks were made, the basic operations inside the clock has almost remained the same, albeit with different parts. Generally, clocks first start with a power source. For older clocks, this comes from mechanical energy, from a pendulum or spring. For newer clocks, this comes from a battery. Then the timekeeping function is measured in an oscillator, the thing that moves or vibrates at a constant rate. A controller takes note of the oscillator's movement, which in turn converts these into short pulses. In older clocks, the controller is known as an escapement. This moves one second for every swing of the pendulum, while in modern clocks, a digital controller takes note of the quartz oscillation. The controller then moves a counter chain, which is responsible for moving the other parts of the clock based on time fractions, like one minute for every 60 seconds. Older clocks utilize calibrated gears, while the modern ones use circuit counters. And finally, there's the indicator. This is what indicates time, or in more common terms, the watch face. Some clocks utilize old-fashioned hands, while the more modern ones display time digitally with a screen. Cars 
it's the thing that literally takes us places. The invention of the automobile or the car has helped people go the distance. It would be hard to imagine today's cities without it because it's used almost everywhere on land. Indeed, cars have come a long way, from the steam engines of the past to the modern cars of today. The first cars were almost carriages or wagons that were powered by steam. These started out during the 18th century. Steam engine cars work when the steam from the heated water pushes into a chamber that has a piston. This moves the piston, which causes rods to move the wheels. Fast forward into the 20th century, today, most cars are powered by fossil fuel, utilizing a combustion engine, which was developed in the early 19th century. Here's how it works. At the core of this engine is the process of combustion where fuel and air is burned. Air enters through the chambers in the engine while fuel is pumped from the gas tank. A spark plug ignites and sets the fuel on fire. This causes small explosions that are contained in cylindrical chambers where pistons can be found. These small explosions make the piston move up and down in succession. This motion makes the crankshaft turn, which gives the car movement. Another critical component in today's cars is the transmission. Transmission allows cars to change and shift gears. Larger gears spin faster while smaller gears pull harder. Shifting gears allow the car to efficiently channel its torque when traveling fast or slow. It used to be that cars utilized manual transmission. A stick shift allows the gears to move when shifted. Most of today's newer cars, however, shift gears automatically. This type of transmission follows a different gear arrangement, sometimes referred to as planetary gear arrangement because smaller sets of gears revolve around a central and a ring gear. But that's just the engine. Throughout the years, a host of features were developed and integrated into cars. Among them are the invention of pneumatic tires, hydraulic suspension, seat belts, car radio, air conditioning, and more. Today's developing trends, however, are taking the car to the new age with smart features. Satellite navigation is one of them. This allows drivers to travel to their destinations without having to consult a map. Another is camera integration and parking sensors, which can help drivers see better when maneuvering tight spaces. Cameras also help in capturing footage should an accident occur. Another recent trend is mobile phone link, which was introduced in response to the growing mobile phone-related driving accident in the recent years. An informative episode from Curious. As always, if you have the questions, then we're here with the answers. Stay inquisitive and stay informed. Catch us again next time on Curious.